O oh, my soul, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, and forget not any of his wonderful benefits. Well, we bless you in that name which is above every name, and that is the name of Jesus. He is Jesus Christ the Holy One. He is Jesus Christ, the righteous Son of God. He's the lily of the valley, and he is the bright and morning star. And I'm just happy tonight, saints, just to know that I'm his child. I, I am happy. I think somebody's on here with me. You ought to bless him tonight. Come on, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Maybe somebody wants to share. If anybody asks you who I am, tell them that I'm a child of the king. Maybe someone wants to celebrate him by saying, my father is rich in houses and land. He holds the wealth of the world in the palm of his hand. He has rubies and diamonds. Yes, he does. He has silver and gold. His coffers are full. He has riches that have never been told. I'm a child of the king. I am a child of, I underscored, the king. And if, if anybody asks you, if they have any level of interest who I really am, hallelujah tonight, bless his name, tell them that I am a child of the king. He is my father. And I am his son. He is your father and you are his sons and daughters. And so he is our God and we are his people. We are the sheep of his hand and the people of his pasture. There is none likened unto him. Besides him, there is no other. He is the only true and living God. He is the only potentate. He is the only Holy One, the only righteous one, the self-existent one, the all-sufficient one. He is our more than enough. He's our high tower and our hiding place. He is the glory and the lifter of our heads. Come on, bless him, bless him, bless him, bless him. We know this is the national day of prayer. And we have lifted up petition, petitions before him all day long in respect to this a uniform day of recognizing the impacting importance of prayer. So when we lift up a prayer, can we go ahead and begin to lift up a praise? When we lift up a petition, can we recognize his awesomeness, his greatness? We praise him for what he's done. We worship him because of who he is. Somebody felt it with me. Because of who you are, I give you glory, lifting up hands without wrath and without doubt, because of who you are, we give you praise. Because of who you are, we lift our voice and say, Lord, we worship you. Yes, we do, Lord, we worship you. Yes, Lord, we worship you. We supplement you. We make your name big. We magnify you just because of who you are. Well, welcome tonight to our 39th episode. I'm excited about what we'll cover tonight in this 39th episode, nearly culminating uh, this first uh, dynamic, this first, if you will, uh, generation, this first genre that has been established by just surveying this eschatological and prophetic landscape we're almost 40 episodes complete. I'm feeling and sensing that the Holy Spirit says after these first 40 episodes, we'll begin to go to another level in our prophetic eschatology and our becoming keenly and more precisely aware of what the Lord is saying in this Issacharian age, in this last, in this age that is the last of the last days, in this season of rapture. How postured, how poised, how positioned should the church be? We're about to talk about it just a little bit more tonight. We know that we go from levels to realms to dimensions. Come on, come on, release a praise. Just one more praise. Release a worship. Hallelujah. 
Oh, Lord, our Lord, how we magnify you, how we love you, how we bless you, how we give you glory. We magnify your holy name. What is man, oh, Lord, that thou art mindful of him? What makes your mind full of us? And what we recognize that we worship you for is that the same thing that was on your mind in your creative, elohistic genius in the beginning is the absolute same thing that is on your mind about us tonight. For you said unto us, you know the thoughts that you think towards us, thoughts of peace and not evil, to bring us to an expected end, somebody said, of good. To bring us to an expected end, to give us a future and a hope. So we bless you. Hallelujah. Our Father and our God, we honor you. We magnify you. We give your name glory. We bless you for this great day, this day that you have heard all our petitions. You have heard us as we cried out unto you. Your promise is that you hear us before we call and you answer us while we're yet speaking and you show us great and mighty things that we do not know. We thank you for every answered prayer today. All over the world, all over the body of Christ, as the saints touched and agreed, as the saints gathered in front of city hall and varied municipalities and venues and over this country, the city, this city, even the world over, even virtually and globally, we have come unto you today and we have laid out before you all of our petitions. We've confessed to you. We've given you adoration and we've given you thanksgiving giving, and we have made supplications. So tonight we bless you. We give you glory. We honor you. We ask that you would bless us in these next few moments. Even those that are gathered virtually under the sound of my voice cause me to say only what the spirit says to the church. Cause me to, to relate and review and recognize your holy word as it pertains to the soon return of your son, our Savior, the King, the Messiah, the Messianic one. And so we bless you and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, saints. I'm so glad to be here with you again in our Being Rapture Ready series, the 39th episode. I'm going to just jump right out there. You already know. Will you be ready when Jesus comes? The Rapture in Review. We're reviewing it. We're, we're studying it. We're surveying it. We're becoming one with this revelation so that we indeed will be ready when our Savior cracks the sky, when Gabriel blows his trumpet and Michael, the great archangel, uh, makes a shout and the Lord shall descend. The Father shall no longer delay the Son's coming. We're looking at the prophetic or eschatological landscape through a wide scope lens tonight. And more than anything, we're gas glad, pardon me, we're grasping and we're gleaning and we're comprehending and we're understanding our glorious election. We are of the elect of God. And were it possible, even the very elect would be deceived. But I declare to you tonight, I decree unto you, I speak commandment in the atmosphere. The elect shall not, cannot, and will not be deceived. God will enlighten the eyes of our understanding by his precious Holy Ghost. So then, be sure your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Be sure and very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. We are the saints of the Most High God. Hallelujah. We are the church, the pillar and ground of truth. Glory to God. We are the body of Christ and members in particular. We are the bride of Christ and he is the bridegroom for his church. And that rock, of ages is Jesus. Rock of ages, cleft for me. You knew I'd say it. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the waters and the blood from thy wounded side, which flow, be of sin, a devil cure, save from wrath and make us pure. Hallelujah. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To every one of you in your respective places, we greet you and we bless you. We honor you. Help me celebrate our illustrious founder, our apostle, and our bishop, the one who God has set in the midst of us and made her a jewel before us and has given her apostolic grace and dimension and apostolic fervor and favor 
And we thank God for Bishop Wade. We thank God for the leadership that she has set in place. We thank God for these elders, these ministers, these ALAs, these deacons, these mothers, all those that make up the body of Christ at the New Covenant House, even our reformational leaders and even our reformational delegates. We're excited that we're right on the threshold and the eve of our annual holy gathering at the mother house, at the, the church where all of this began. And that is in wonderful pop. We'll see you just after Mother's Day. So we thank God for you. And we got a lot to cover tonight. So I'm going to move rapidly, but by the Spirit's help with the mastery of clarity. And so here we go. In the name of he who openeth and no man shut it and shut it and no man opened it. In the name of our risen Savior, in the name of our returning King, in the name of Shiloh, in the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, our Messiah. Glory be to the righteous. Release it out there. Start a watch party. Start a tag party. Start a, a, a I'm a responsible saint party. I'm one that's watching and waiting for the Lord's soon return. Grace and peace should be multiplied to every believer because the grace and peace of every believer must be salvation, full and free. Sanctification should also be a part of the grace and the peace that is released unto every believer. Sanctification set apart for his glory. And then eternal life, eternally secure in the old saints used to say, the sweet old by and by. By and by, oh, when the morning comes. That's the rapture, the resurrection morning, that great getting up morning. That's when all the saints of God are gathered home. Uh, we will tell the story of our, our, our gathering and the gleaning of the saints. Uh, those saints that are raptured in the church boat. Uh, dead and alive, and then those that are gleaned just before uh, the Antichrist is destroyed because they'll be gleaned just before the marriage supper of the Lamb. So no saints will be left behind, even those coming up out of great tribulation. Yes, hallelujah. And so they said, we'll tell the story how we overcome our heavenly testimonies during that great coronation. It's a mystery. And yet we'll understand it better by and by. Saints, you remember 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 14. If you're looking at King James, it sounds exactly like this. Now we know in part and we prophesy in part. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. We are living in a time in God's eternal timetable in, in not only the chronos, but the kairos of God, that these times cannot be immature times, but they are mature times. They are the maturation of time because it is about to be the expiring of time. So time is a man. So those of us who are in the time realm, in the earth realm, must no longer be tossed to and fro as children by the slight cunning craftiness of man. That's the corresponding truth of the gospel. So Paul says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. For we now see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is God's love, his ever abounding love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice God did not send his son into the world 
to condemn the world, but that the world through him, the finished work of Jesus Christ, his salvific message and his saving grace and his sanctifying power demonstrated as he rose from the dead, rising, he justified us, freed us forever. So God sent not his son into the world, saints, my brothers and my sisters, fellow yoke bearers, those that are waiting, awaiting his coming. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn us, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Notice this. Salvation is for anybody. It's just not for everybody. We'll get to that just a little bit later in this episode. But the gospel's intent was not to save the whole world, but to give everybody in the world, anybody in the world, an opportunity to that's the whosoever will that Jesus invited. Let him come, but all would not come. Well, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Hmm, I'm thinking what on earth, what in the world, what in heaven's name, what in the name of the Lord's church is going on in the kingdom? We are kingdom de dwellers. We are the church, but we are kingdom dwellers. We are the ambassadors, we are his agents and his agency in his kingdom, in his absence. The kingdom, the condition of it, in absentia of the king. Until the king comes back, we have been authorized. We have been uh, duly deputized, if you will. We are the legislative body in the kingdom. That is the ecclesia, the church, the called out body to legislate until he comes. Whatever we say on earth, whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What is going on then in the kingdom? Systems, governments, presidents, and powers. Racism. Is that a real question? What racism? What terrorism? What bigotry? Come on, Tim Scott. Come on, man. Blinders on for real? There's some things we just should not say. We know that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We don't get ourselves entangled with the affairs of this life. But the, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We make a significant difference when we know who we are, saints. Will you be ready when Jesus comes? I mean, what pandemic? What noise and pestilence? What racism? What on earth? I mean, here they go again. George Floyd. Rest in peace. Breathe. Derek Chauvin, the trial is over. But the ridiculous, senseless attempt and request for a retrial because of the alleged jury being compromised or juror being compromised. Seriously, now, come on. And further still, come on, Governor D. And his masterful impersonation of the infamous 45. For real, little 45? I can't. Listen, saints, can't you see that truly we are living in the last of the last days is still fasting, praying, and readying time. So tonight, as we round up this 39th episode, one episode shy of 40, complete sessions concerning the believer's hope and joy, bidding this old sinful world fare thee well, Fare thee well. Let's launch out a little bit deeper. The last episode, we followed John the Revelator. That's what I call him. Uh, maybe you call him the Revealer or the divinely appointed messenger. You know, John out on the Isle, is Isle of Patmos, the oldest living apostle, the only one not to suffer a martyr's death. Shared with us his rapturesque experience in Revelations chapter four. Let's look. Here we go quickly. We have a lot of ground to cover, but we had to set precedent and we had to establish the fact that we have all things common. And we understand the same thing, saints, because we've been together for 38 previous episodes and have access to them as we need to go back and review. Maybe some of you tonight will type and will 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 send us a, a, a indication that these have been very helpful episodes. Let us hear from you. But as we move, here it is. 
we are the saints of the Most High. We are the church of the firstborn. And we know that we want to be ready when Jesus comes. Come on, somebody type it. We know that we want to be ready when Jesus comes. And we know that we will be ready. We should be compelling and persuading men, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Because we know that we want to one day walk in Jerusalem just like John. Let's look back quickly at uh, Revelation chapter 4 as we viewed it last week. Let us review it quickly. We're on the top side of 8 o'clock. I promise the times will be redeemed tonight, but I want to fasten in in this next to the lad last episode of 40. And then we'll see where the Lord takes us. Revelation chapter 4. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open. And that's verse four in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne. And he that set was to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone, a uh, brilliant and amazing light, uh, unable to be characterized by words or by uh, a form or a uh, a being. So he could, John can only describe God as splendid, blended light. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald green representing great godly prosperity and the rainbow reminding us of the covenant not the hijacked rainbow i'm not going there yet but the rainbow that god set in the sky is also set around his throne as a constant reminder as a constant indicator not as though he's seen now but that was one of the first things that john saw recognizing that god came live he won't change and it's always now with him his promises are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. And then round about the throne were four and 20 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. We talked about last week. This has to represent Old and New Testament saints. And these white robes represent righteousness and purity. And these crowns are the rewards that we'll receive at the beam of the judgment seat of Christ for the righteous works that are mingled with our faith and the reward of our savior, our bridegroom. These are war rewards and trinkets of our betrothal to him, of our engagement just about to be consummated by the marriage supper of the lamb as he presents us a glorious bride, a chaste church before his father. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices denoting the awesomeness of God's power and his mightiness to judge and to save his Elohistic genius and his Jehovahistic genius. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. And we don't have to uh, wonder what those seven lamps represented, which are the seven spirits of God or the seven or the complete works of the Holy Spirit, whose work when we get to heaven in the magnitude and the measure and the manner of it right now, while the church is still in the world, in the kingdom will be over. And so it's a representation of God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit, blessed Trinity casting down their golden crowns around the glasses seat. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings. Uh, you remember Isaiah. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. And they were full of eyes within, and they will rest not day and night. Speaking of the omniscience of God, he knows everything within, without. He has eyes of flaming fire, able to see between light and darkness, to see between uh, pretentious and precious, to be able to see between 
false and true. In heaven alone, no is sin, no sin is found. And they didn't rest day and night. Uh, here it is again. Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And there were angels, cherubims, crying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things for thy pleasure, for thy pleasure they are and were created. What John shares here is his own personal rapture experience, if you will. We must pay co close attention to the details because the details are authentic and indigenous only of the third heaven and the throne, throne room of God. These are literal descriptions and are not allegorized. These are real elders that represent 12 and 12 distinct positions, that of Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. That is, that is of the old patriarchs and the New Testament Apostles, those that followed him, handled him, slept with him, walked with him, saw his mighty acts in his earthly ministry as the man, Christ Jesus, the same man that sitteth at the right hand of God and ever liveth to make intercession for all saints. Whew, we're doing well. Here we go. The conclusion then of that heavenly vision or envisioning or uh, John's rapture, his personal rapture that he shares with us in Revelations chapter 4, then the conclusion would be the reference to the 24 elders in the book of Revelation can be first found in Revelation 4, 1 through 5. There are three clues that the Bible gives about the identity of the elders. The first clue is, clue is found in the apparel worn by the elders, their white robes. The second clue is found in the number of elders and their role in laying the foundation of the Old and New Testaments of scriptures, the law and the prophets. And then the Acts and the epistles of the scriptures as represented by the priestly breastplate stones worn by God on the throne. The final clue is found in the message of the coming Christ written by the Old Testament prophets along with the New Testament apostles who saw Christ. These clues along with numerous other references show us that the 24 elders are form, former Jews and Gentiles. And other references show us that the 24 elders are, form, are prophets and apostles who are in heaven as members of the universal church made up of all humanity. The church is made up of all humanity, both Jew and Gentile. It is a heavenly organism, not an earthly kingdom that has trusted Christ as their savior. Now also there were four beasts, four living creatures, if you will, hallelujah. Let me give it to you quickly. It has been spiritually discussed that these four faces of these living beings are representative of different things. As seen in Numbers chapter 2, whenever the 12 tribes of Israel would travel, they would camp in four groups of three tribes, which each group jutting off into a different direction. One tribe was assigned to be the representative tribe each in each of the four groups. And that tribe was to fly its banner in their respective camps. Then we know from Genesis that the symbol of Judah was that of the lion. The symbol of Ephraim was the ox. The symbol of Reuben was a man and the symbol of Dan was an eagle. And then we see where the Gospels give us an interesting dynamic and dimension and perspective. And what that is, is this. The Gospel of Matthew reveals Christ as the king, the lion. And then the Gospel of Mark reveals Christ as the servant of God, the great colossal ox or calf. And the Gospel of Luke reveals that humanity of Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, both human and divine. So the symbol is a man. And the Gospel of John reveals the divinity of Christ. Uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That is indeed the divinity of Christ. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. I and the father and are one. And so he has to be characterized by the flying eagle.
again, the relevant, the relevant question, saints, friends, continue to survey the scriptures, the corresponding truths of God's word that never collide, but they correspond, they connect, they convince, they convey, they constrain. Again, the relevant question becomes, will you be ready when Jesus comes? No cliche, I'm not just throwing that out there as uh, religious rhetoric, but the real question is, will we be ready when Jesus comes? The whole essence of these episodes are epic because they are profoundly relevant, significant. Type it. I will be ready when Jesus comes because that's the relevant question. It is the existential dilemma of man. Uh, everybody will spend eternity somewhere. Where will you spend eternity in heaven or in hell? No cliche. For real, saints. Notice with me then. Revelations chapter 22 as we trudge forward tonight. Verse 6. I picked six because six is the number of man. I really focused on verses seven through 21. Interestingly, three times seven. Okay, here we go. Verse six. And he said unto me, and he said unto me, these sayings are faithful. This is John again. He shared with us in chapter four, his own rapturous experience up to the third heaven to the throne room of God. Now he picks up in Revelations 22, Verse six. Hmm. And he said unto me, these things are faithful and true. That sounds like Jesus because on his thigh is written faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to shew unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Verse seven. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. I recommend reading the prophecies of this book. And I, John, now we know, indeed, it's John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. I told you, some of us see John as God's divinely appointed special messenger. And this angel, watch what he says to John. Then said he unto me, as John had fallen down at his feet to worship, see thou do it now. Don't do that. For I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Now he tells John, worship God. Verse 10, and he said unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Notice that is the absolute opposite of what Daniel was told. Daniel was told, uh, seal up the prophecy, close up the book, put down your pen, don't write anymore. Until the end time when the book will be reopened. And John here is told, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, because those living in the end times will need access, not just actual literal access or literary access, but but eschatological, prophetic, revelatory insight that only the Holy Spirit, which will be in his present day ministry as the paraclete, the God, the one that will open up the deep things of God. The book, leave the prophecy of this book open for the time is at hand. Now, he was talking about now, saints, tonight, the time is at hand that the relevant question must be asked and answered. Will you be ready when Jesus comes? Wow. Hallelujah. Let's look at verse 11. Are you with me? He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Notice, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. That's two thirds of the he's on the earth. But then only one third, he says, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Then it says, he that is holy, let him be holy still. Uh, perhaps 
only half of the populace, only a third of the populace, only uh, the few. And few there be that find it. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And many there be that enter in thereat. Let him that is unjust be unjust still. Him that is filthy be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Verse 13. I am Alpha and omega i'm the alpha of ages and i'm the omega of ages which means i'm the beginning and i'm the end i'm the first and the last blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right here it is to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and so and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie that is that abominable slap in god's face the ultimate abomination to suggest that there's alternate lifestyles that god did not provide by the holy scriptures saints we've been together long enough for you to know that he that loveth a lie and maketh a lie chooses to believe something other than what god says in terms of him being the god of abraham the god of isaac and the god of jacob he ordained marriage in the Garden of Eden between Adam and Eve, and he, inst he instituted in the Garden of Eden between Adam and Eve, and he ordained it by his son's presence and the miraculous turning of water into wine in that wedding at Cana. God has established that he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and he has ordered and orchestrated the dynamic of family. No same sex anything. We've covered it. I unabashedly say there is no alternate lifestyle in the presence of God that is holy. Just because it's been made legal doesn't make it right. Let me continue. Because he says, and who will so ever love it and make it a lie? I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star and the spirit and the bride say come. And let him that hear it say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will. Determine that God's way and only God's way is holy and right. Let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy god shall take away his part out of the book of life god is serious concerning his word he is god all by himself and he doesn't need our help to transcribe or to change or to alter his holy writ and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book, the holy promises, which he testifies these things saith, And he which testifies these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, that's the saints, that's the church. That's those of us who submit to his word, his will, and his way, his precepts, his commandments, and his statutes. We don't alter, we don't argue, we don't amend, but we honor his word. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So be it. Saints, I have just a few minutes, and I'll get as far in the rest of the way as I possibly can. I'm loving the generosity of the Holy Spirit tonight through the fresh revelatory insight of his holy scriptures. This is not a, 
uh, opinionated broadcast. It's the unadulterated word of God standing on firmly the solidarity and the sureness of the scriptures. So, just for good measures, let's look. Back at the kingdom of heaven parables in the gospel of Matthew. The Lord's prayer, for instance, I'd like to take a quick look at and maybe that's as far as we'll get. We'll see. Matthew 6, 9 through 11, which is a part of the sermon on the mount. It asks that the kingdom, this prayer in particular, may come, not that the church may increase and prosper. There is no petition for salvation from sin in it. It asks that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is a prayer for those who shall be living in the tribulation period, who in their persecutions will long for the return of the king. The, the, the model prayer when Jesus' disciples said, Master, teach us how to pray, works very well for us. But in its literal dynamic, it is the prayer that Christ, brother, and the Jews will pray and utter during the tribulation where the, 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 the intent of the heathen oppressor the Antichrist will be to obliterate and to annihilate them. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. At that time, the beast, the Antichrist, will be in power and no one shall be able to buy, sell, or trade except he hath the mark of the beast. And this explains the petition, give us this day our daily bread, for unless food is supplied miraculously, they will perish. Unless it's supplied by other nations who Jesus will judge in the fourth judgment of nations, the sheep and goat nations. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you visited me. This prayer in Matthew is to the Jews. It is from the Jews to God to preserve their lives during the time of Jacob's troubles. So we see that they shall particularly need to be delivered not from evil, but from the evil one, from Satan, who will tempt them to recant their testimony, even like in the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church, and worship the beast, even as the church began to look at the emperor Constantine as though he was the second coming of Christ, because he made Christianity the national religion, you remember. The Sermon on the Mount was spoken by Christ before his rejection and was the constitution of the then offered kingdom. Now that the kingdom has been withdrawn, it is not in force, but will be in the millennial kingdom when Christ sits on the throne of David. So we see that we must not discriminate between the dispensations and not dislocate scriptures. Uh, the Our Father's model prayer is a great prayer for us to subscribe to, but not without clear revelatory understanding that it has its greatest intent during the time of Jacob's trouble. After the resurrection of Jesus, the hope of a visible kingdom was revived. And just before his ascension, the disciples asked him a question. Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? His reply was, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath in his own power, Acts 1, 6 and Acts 1, 7. It is clear from this that the disciples were looking for an earthly visible kingdom and not a spiritual one. The church is the spiritual organism, ecclesia in the earth realm. realm. That's why we will be called out and called out. But the nation of Israel is an earthly kingdom and has an earthly inheritance. And it is yet to be set up. The time has not come yet. In Luke 19, 11, Luke 19, 12, we reread. Because he was not to Jerusalem and, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear, he spake this parable. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. From this we see that Jesus is a certain nobleman and he has gone into a far country, heaven. He says, it is expedient that I go away because if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. 
Let not your heart be troubled. You remember. Believe in God. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me for in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, watch this. I go away into a very far country. I go away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's unadulterated truth. There is no, there is nothing in scriptures to prove that Jesus is a king now. David was anointed king over Israel long before King Saul died in anticipation of that event. But he did not become king and take the throne until after Saul's death. So while Jesus was born king of the Jews, he does not become king until he actually takes the throne. At present, he is engaged in his high priestly function and he shares his father's throne by being seated at his right hand. And he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. Whew, hallelujah. So right now, the kingdom is in mystery. The king having been rejected, it was impossible then to set up the kingdom. The kingdom took on another aspect known as the kingdom in mystery. This mystery form of the kingdom is described in the kingdom of heaven parables found in Matthew's gospel alone. If we want to know the character of this period, which covers the time between the ascension of Christ and the rapture of the church, we must study these parables. They are 12 in number. They are found in Matthew's gospel alone. And most of them in Matthew chapter 13. After Jesus had spoken the, par the parable of the sword, the disciples came to him and said, why speakest thou unto them in parables? They want to know, Jesus, why are you speaking in earthly stories with heavenly meaning? He said, because it is given unto you and you only to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It's not given to everybody. Let him that have ear hear what the spirit said to the church. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom in mystery, the kingdom while the king is absent. He said, occupy till I come. Stay at work. Work while it's day for when night cometh, no man can work. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. In verse 35, he gives his reason for speaking to them in parables that it might be fulfilled as spoken by the prophets. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law uh, or the prophets, but to fulfill it. He says, I come and the, 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 the God of this world has nothing in me. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. So he says, I came that the, I speak in parables that the prophecies or the words of the prophets would be fulfilled. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. The kingdom of heaven parables cannot describe the messianic or millennial kingdom. For it is, it was no secret to the Old Testament prophets, neither do they describe a spiritual kingdom for the figures they use are all of earthly nature. Then they must then describe the character of the present dispensation in its earthly aspect during the king's absence. The kingdom of heaven parables. Remember, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. But the kingdom of heaven parables uh, describe uh, a dynamic, a a disposition that doesn't seem all righteous. It doesn't seem godly in a lot of its disposition. From its vantage point, we notice their um, good and bad fish. We know specifically with the parable of the sower, three fourths of the seeds that were sown fall in unprofitable places, wayside, and the devil's bird immediately comes and snatches the seed. The seed being the word, then it falls by uh, the thorny ground and the thorns choke out the life of the seed. And it falls on stony ground and, and thorny ground and, and stony ground. It is not able to take root. So the sun scorches it. 
the 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 thorn the thorns that choke out the life of the seed are listed in, in Mark's gospel, uh the, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things. So again, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom in mystery or the kingdom of heaven parables describe a chaotic, restless, uh, untoward generation that is perverse. That are the times that we are living in consistent and parallel with the Laodicean church age, which is this present age, a lukewarm, nauseating church age where the church has a form of godliness but denies the power thereof. That is the condition and the state of the kingdom in the last of the last days. You remember, we're approaching Pentecost. So let me underscore this. Peter on the day of Pentecost said, this is that. These are not drunk as you suppose. This is that of which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and my sons and daughters shall prophesy. So if 2,000 years ago it was the last days, then 2,000 and some years later it has to be the last of the last days, and the time is at hand, and the end is approaching where well, the church will experience that same thing that John shared with us, his own personal rapture that we will be caught up. It will be a seizing by force. It will be a great snatch in that great getting up morning. Well, my time is just about up. Let me conclude with this. The Lord's parables are not allegories. A vein of falsehood characterizes all allegories. Things are represented fictitiously in allegories. The parables of our Lord present things truthfully. He used parables so that those who were not disposed to believe might not understand. These things can only be spiritually discerned with the help of the Holy Spirit. And logic and just logical approach or reasoning and rationale, picking the Bible up and reading it so you can know or quote scriptures or uh, argue or debate it, that's why Jesus spoke in parables, because it was not to be argumentative like the Epicureans or uh, the Grecians would do uh, when Paul was at the Areopagus, when he passed by one of their altars and saw this inscription, subscription, where they would much rather argue philosophy to the unknown God. He says, let me do this for you. Let me explain or reveal him to you who you ignorantly worship. So now, the parables was to dis not were not to dispose truths that are heavenly truths to those who refuse to believe. And that the word of God might be fulfilled as spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Also because blindness in part had fallen upon Israel. And the clear revelation would only discourage them or drive them further into unbelief. That's why Paul could say, brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved for they have a zeal of God. He was talking about Israel as a nation because they rejected their Messiah. That's why he said they're not saved. My prayer for them is that they might be saved. So blindness in part had come to the Jews. And so there's nothing in the scripture that proves that Jesus is is king now. Although he's king, he's not sitting on the throne of David as has been prophesied of old. So, whew, I'm going to stop right there for tonight. We got to stop. I don't want to stop, but we got to stop. Whew, glory. When I say whoo, glory, that's me putting on the brakes because uh, my apostle has taught me you can stop teaching at any significant point. So we stop tonight. Saints, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. It has been my joy and my job. I'm just a slingshot shepherd making relevant truths known in a time of social injustice and refusing to ignore what is clear to be seen that our Lord is soon to return. So this is our stopping point for tonight. My God's getting us ready 
for that great day. And the question becomes, who shall be able to stand? Come on, friends, would you plant a seed with me tonight? For those of us that are planning, who consistently, generously support this ministry and support the cause of Christ and the work of our Savior, even in these cataclysmic times where men are calling right, wrong, and wrong, right. We cry loud and we spare not. And we blow the trumpet in Zion and we sound the alarm on God's holy mountain. So tonight we appreciate your generosity in giving. We're going to ask you to plant a seed with us tonight, a $12 seed. That's it, just a $12 seed. Some of it you may want to double down and plant a $24 seed. I'm going to, because of the graciousness of God and because of the great need that I have financially, I'm going to plant a $36 seed and know that God is governmentally perfecting his called out ecclesia, this legislative body, the church, the pillar and ground of truth, the church of the firstborn, the church of God by faith, the real church of God by faith. No cliche, no cliche. Thank you so much for planning with us tonight. Uh, I'm sure the means by which for you to share and give are, are being made readily known unto you. So we thank God for your generosity. And my purpose and my prayer is that each time we join together and we plant in obedience and in joy, that God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, not only to us, but to our children and our children's children. I command, declare, and decree God's favor on your lives. Now, Lord, we bless you as you blessed us tonight. We continue to thank you for keeping us in this pandemic, keeping us from the plot and the strategies and the plan of the enemy. We know that you are a healer. You are a savior. You are a keeper. You are a fortress about us. You are a bulwark that never failed. You are a high tower in our hiding place, our shield and our buckler. So we thank you for your saving faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm finished for now. I'm Pastor Paris T. Taylor, lead pastor at the New Covenant Perfecting Ministries, where Bishop Julia E. W. Wade is our founding apostle. And we thank you for joining in with us tonight and sharing in this triumphing truth. You already know me out here and you're coming to know me as the Slingshot Shepherd. I'm Pastor Paris T. Taylor. You know that I love you. NCPM Trial Christian Academy, PCPC, CDCKC of the Reformation. You know that I love you. Peace. We're out.